Good evening, comrades. Thank you very much for joining us to discuss the deception of the Oslo Accords and the two-state solution. Deception? Didn't the people involved get a Nobel Peace Prize? They did. In 1994, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, uh, Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, and PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat received the, the Nobel Peace Prize together following the signing of the Oslo Accords, which were supposed to create peace in the Middle East. The European Union is another entity that received the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Barack Obama and my favorite, Henry Kissinger. So it's probably not saying a lot getting the Nobel Peace Prize. We're discussing the issue of the Oslo Accords and the uh, two-state solution tonight with author and commentator Gada Kada Kalmi. Hello, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome. She'll be giving an introduction of about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we're opening up for questions and contributions from the floor. We have to finish tonight's session a bit earlier by 8.20. So if you have questions or contributions, please keep them short and come in straight after the introduction by Comrade uh, Kami. So without further ado, um, over to you, Gada. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Um, uh, hello to everyone. Um, <clears throat> And um, uh, I'm going to be talking about, um, as Tina said, I'm going to be talking about um, the two-state solution and the Oslo Agreement, because I think the, um, the, these two topics are, it, 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 you know, one could regard them as being the uh, precursors to creating the sort of environment from which the event on October the 7th took place. Um, <clears throat> now, what is interesting about October the 7th is that this, um, this operation by Hamas, uh, which uh, has been described in different ways, um, uh, either extremely negatively, um, but also in terms of its significance, really, for what's going on uh, in the Israel-Palestine situation and beyond, in fact. Now, one would have thought that the events of October the 7th uh, should have led um, politicians to try and draw some lessons and correct lessons about the um, the problem with with uh, Israel, the problems created for Palestine and the Palestinians. Um, but what it did do was revive conversations about the two state solution. It's really most remarkable this that the lesson learned from uh, October the 7th was not, as one might have hoped, a re-evaluation of the whole story of Palestine the, 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 that led us to that point and that led us to a very, very dramatic event. Instead of sitting down and asking the question, why did this happen? How did we get here? What we've got instead is that world leaders, of course, Western politicians, are now reviving the talk about the two-state solution, a solution which never happened and is never going to happen. Um, but I think it's important perhaps to review something about the two-state solution because everybody's talking about it. Now, you will be aware, I, I suppose, that um, uh, the, there has been there's an international consensus on this two-state solution. Um, there has never been um, an agreement on how to resolve the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, which has enjoyed so much support as the two-state solution. Uh, we have a lineup of very important world bodies that support this solution from the United Nations when in 2012 um, 
uh, the, the, um, the UN General Assembly voted to admit Palestine as a, an observer, non-member state, um, <clears throat> a majority of the states represented at the General Assembly recognized the Palestinian state. Um, likewise, the European Union um, supports the two-state solution, the United States, the Arab League, and last but not least, the PLO, the Palestinian representative itself. All these bodies support and recognize and have a consensus and reach a consensus on the desirability of the two-state solution um, as, a, as, a, as a way to resolve this long-running uh, conflict. Um, so that's why we need to talk about it a bit more, refresh our memories. I suppose a lot of people know about it, but we need to refresh our memories because there's so much, uh, it's so much in, in the news. Um, <clears throat> what is it? What is the two-state solution? Well, the two-state solution proposed a division of historic Palestine, mandate Palestine, however you want to uh, like to think of it, uh, uh, dividing it into unequal portions, 78% <clears throat> going to what is the Israeli state, and then 22%, which represents the post-1967 occupied Palestinian territories, which formed 22% of the original Palestine, that those Palestinian territories then become the Palestinian state. So that's those are the two states in the two-state solution. Um, now, um, when we examine that really a bit more closely, we realize um, this solution is a nonsense. It's never got anywhere and never will for very, very good reasons. Firstly, it's unfair on the Palestinians, deeply unfair, to actually uh, give more than half of the original territory of Palestine, where all the Palestinians used to live, to give that to um, uh, settlers, uh, now called Israel, um, and uh, to reserve a, a fifth of the original Palestine for the Palestinians. And now, I, you don't have to be a genius to see immediately that 22%, even if it happened, cannot possibly accommodate the Palestinian refugees. The refugees are not incidental. Though people try to ignore them, Western politicians don't want to talk about them, Israel doesn't want to talk about them. The reality is they are the, the, the very core of the Palestinian story. Five to six million refugees living in UN refugee camps, and uh, many more millions living in exile, people like myself. So altogether, these people need a solution. It cannot be met by 22% of the original Palestine. So on those grounds, on those grounds that there's no right of return, unfair division of the land, uh, this is not acceptable. However, there's a, a second extremely important reason why the two-state solution cannot happen and hasn't happened. That is because logistically, it's very difficult to see how it can happen. If you look at the map, if you look at the map of uh, Israel's uh, settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories, it immediately becomes clear there is no territory on which to establish the Palestinian state without uh, somebody forcing the Israelis to remove their settlements. There is no way that what is left now of the original Palestine can form the territory of the Palestinian state. Now, thirdly, thirdly, as if those two issues I've just raised were not enough, Israel itself has turned this down. It's no Israeli leader has ever accepted the creation of Palestinian state. 
No Israeli leader accepts the two-state solution. So why are we talking about this? Why do Western states continue to talk about the two-state solution? All right, well, let's just refresh our memories a little bit because it's because of the importance of uh, that's been accorded to the solution. We need to go back a little bit to see how it came about. Well, it really was came about in a series of steps. Uh, the 1974 Palestine National Council, that is the parliament in exile, if you like, of the Palestinian people, in 1974, stopped talking about total liberation of the land and started talking about setting up um, an authority on whatever land was liberated. And in 1977, the PNC of that year confirmed that uh, what would happen is that all land that was liberated could become, uh, would become something with a, a governing authority, a Palestinian governing authority. That's the earliest language in which the question, the Palestinian state was spoken about. Saudi Arabia picked up, picked this up, and in 1982 produced a plan called the Fez Plan, which really was talking about two states. Uh, and um, from that moment on, um, uh, the the idea became familiar until the Declaration of Independence, so-called Declaration of Independence, which took place in the 1988 Palestine National Council meeting in Algiers. That declaration spelled out that there would be a Palestinian state on the 1967 borders, 22% uh, of the original Palestine, and it was coupled with recognition of Israel. That is the kind, those are the steps that led to uh, the idea of something called the Palestinian state on the 1967 territories. And that, of course, formed the basis, the substrate, for the Oslo Agreement. Now, the Oslo Agreement, and I apologize if people know all this stuff, but I think it's important to go over it again, even if you know it. Um, in 1993, <clears throat> something called the Oslo Accords were drawn up between Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. So in other words, the two parties to this Oslo Accord were a state on the one hand and an organization on the other. And, and what did this do? What did the Oslo Agreement do? Well, what it did was to accord Israeli recognition of the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, but the Palestinian side, represented by the PLO, agreed to recognize Israel in, quote, secure, safe and secure borders. It agreed to give up, um, quote, terrorism, which means, of course, resistance to anybody else, uh, except if you're Israel and its Western backers. So to give up, quote, terrorism, and promise to amend the PLO <clears throat> National Charter. The PLO Charter, which is the charter of the Palestinian people that the PLO produced in the 1960s. Uh, it would amend it and remove all the clauses which were uh, potentially offensive to to Israel. Um, why did the Palestinians enter into an agreement that was so unequal and so unfair? Well, one has to remember the background. The background was that following the Gulf War, or in which the PLO um, supported Saddam Hussein, um, the the um, the Funding for the PLO dried up. Uh, nobody wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge or accept the PLO in, anymore. And uh, they were almost irrelevant. This had followed on 
1982, where there had been this war in Lebanon, in Beirut, when the PLO was expelled uh, because of Israel with Israeli, uh, with Israeli um, uh, um, plan behind it. The PLO was expelled and its fighters ended up in places like Tunis and Yemen, which really were very far from where the action is in Palestine. Uh, so we had a PLO by uh, 1992, 93, which was increasingly irrelevant. It was bankrupt. And in addition to that, there had been the first Intifada in 1987, in which an alternative leadership looked as if it was coming to the fore, a leadership from inside the Palestinian territories, making the PLO even more irrelevant. So the Arafat uh, and the PLO decided that the only way forward was to negotiate directly with Israel, not have third parties uh, speaking on their behalf, and that's what they did. There were secret negotiations in Norway, which um, then led to the formal drawing up of the Oslo Accords. Uh, what did what did both sides, what did either side get out of the Oslo Accords? Because there is something, there is something for both sides. Uh, on the one hand, as far as the PLO was concerned, uh, they were back on the scene, they were back, they were relevant once more, and they would be able to steer uh, the Palestinian political process from then on. Um, at the same time, um, uh, Israel, uh, Israel's interest was that if it negotiated um, appropriately for its own benefit, of course, uh, you would end up with a situation in which it could offload the Palestinians who are in the occupied territories and formed a, quote, democratic, demographic threat to the Zionists. They didn't want all these non-Jews. So here was a, a, a wonderful way of separating from these non-Jews uh, in the shape of these Oslo agreement. Um, and what happened as a result of that was all the Palestinian population centers uh, occupied by Israel were then uh, given autonomy in civil civil affairs. They were, if you like, removed from the population of Israel. They had their own um, authority, which was the Palestinian Authority, which ran the civil affairs, not political. So that was uh, good for Israel, separation. At the same time, of course, Israel retained control of all the borders of this uh, autonomous, so-called autonomous area, sea, land, air, all under Israel's control. So uh, it was a very cheap way for the Israelis to offload these uh, the, the Palestinian areas and the Palestinian population. But you know, behind that, behind that, um, one has to ask, did Arafat not know that? Did Arafat and the PLO not know that that's what Israel wanted and that's what would happen? Well, uh, uh, in my opinion, they did. They did know, but they got to a point where Arafat had a conviction that um, if the PLO could get a foothold in Palestine, albeit in, in the occupied areas, if the Palestinian movement could get a foothold, then this foot in the door approach would um, would advance Palestinian aims, meaning that you know, in the, like in the old story, you know, the the the, tra the salesman who, who who's trying to sell you something puts his foot in the door, so you can't shut the door. T talks to you, talks you into, talks to you into um, having a look at whatever he's selling. You then say, "All right, you can come into the hallway," 
uh, which he does. And then after a bit, he gets into the kitchen. And then after a bit, he goes into other parts of the house. I, I know this sounds flippant, but that is actually the sort of thinking that Arafat employed. And to him, it seemed this was the only way to get the Palestinians uh, back into Palestine. So um, uh, the results, of course, of the Oslo Agreement were not good for the Palestinians at all. Uh, Israel never kept to any of its deadlines or undertakings under the Oslo Agreement. Um, the Area A that it conceded uh, had no sovereignty of any kind. And as I pointed out before, all borders were controlled by Israel. And the settlement building carried on, carried on. So, uh, uh, in, in fact, by therefore, by 2023, by the time of October 7th, what we had it was a Palestinian territory full of settlements uh, in which no possibility of a Palestinian state could be envisaged and in which Palestinian rights had been so downgraded by um, recurrent um, uh, so-called um, peace process negotiations, which only benefited Israel and didn't benefit the Palestinians, uh, who saw their rights downgraded. <clears throat> and um, I, I just want to read, if I may, a very short extract from my new book, One State, which goes into this whole, this whole issue. I just put it like this, that the Palestinian strategy for in, in, in Oslo, I've described it as a despairing strategy to salvage something from which to regenerate the remnants of Palestine, even though the price was high. Without this sacrifice, it seemed to Arafat and his successors that Israel would finish what it has started in 1948. The destruction of the Palestinian people, the loss of the land that remained to them and possibly their total expulsion. That matters should have come to this pass of a people forced to delegitimize their own national cause, renounce their legal rights and recognize the theft of their land by others as legally and morally acceptable, as implied in Palestine's recognition of Zionism, is the stuff of tragedy. So I really feel that that construction is the one that is closest to the truth. One thing that has emerged from all this, and that is the issue of Israeli impunity has to be very, very clearly understood that the whole process of peacemaking, whether it's Oslo, whether it's two states, whatever it is, the flaw in it is that you've got asymmetrical parties where the power is on one side and not on the other. Secondly, that Palestinian rights, as I pointed out, had to be downgraded to make any kind of settlement possible. And thirdly, the thing that we really, really must never forget, and which helps us to understand the horrific events of today in Gaza, and that is Israeli impunity. The fact that Israel has been allowed to do all this to the Palestinians, to international law, and to any kind of understanding of human rights, or even common decency. That is Israeli impunity. So I'm thinking perhaps it's best I, 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 I leave it there. <clears throat> I'd be very happy to um, answer any questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Gada. That was very, very well structured, easy to understand. Thank you for reminding us how the Oslo cards came uh, about comrades if you have questions or comments please click 
uh, raise hand or put your questions in the Q and A, and I can read it out for you. Um, a couple of cast questions for you, um, Garda, to keep get the get the ball rolling. Um, your solution, as your bo your book implies, is one state with presumably rights for all, uh, you know, a democratic state, which opens up a similar a similar problem, though, isn't it? When you mentioned the as asymmetric uh, issue, um, you know, why why would Israelis give up their privileged position and allow Palestinians to have equal rights? You know, could you just outline your your solution to this problem or well, the, the situation, really? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> look, uh, because of what I have already said, I mean, any other idea of uh, how to resolve this is a, is really a non-starter. Uh, there is only one way forward, and that is indeed by the creation of a democratic state, which uh, um, with equal rights, equal uh, rights of citizenship, and equal rights in every other way. There is only that possibility. Uh, to, now, in saying this, and I explain this in my book, I am not in any sense uh, implying that the Israelis would accept this, that they would be happy with it, either the government or the actual population. And on, and by the way, the Palestinians would find it quite difficult as well to to live with their former oppressors and and the people who usurp their land, etc. So it's not based on some idea of um, utopian uh, uh, friendship and everybody suddenly loving everybody. Of course not. It's really, if you like, some. It's if you like, it's a way of recognizing that there really is no other end point, unless you. Unless Israel gets away with expelling all the Palestinians, which it appears to be wanting to do currently, uh, uh, while there is a Palestinian population in historic Palestine, the only way forward, really, for those two communities is to learn to live together in a democracy where they have equal rights. They don't have to love each other. But in time, of course, in time, people get used to uh, a new situation. So it was, I was so anxious to make clear that there really is only one trajectory. And that, and that is uh, what I've just described. We will be discussing this uh, a bit more in two weeks' time when we have a round, round table with Moshe Machova, for example, who has a regional um, outlook, he says, a, a socialist regional solution. Um, but we also have um, Adam Keller from Israel, from uh, a, a peace group in Israel. He's He's got a two-state solution. So we will be looking at this again and looking at the different um, solutions being put forward. It is clearly a hugely distressing and complicated, complicated situation in the sense that you describe the settlements make make everything very, very difficult to to split into into areas um i'm going to ask comrades now to come in i'm suggesting i take two or three at the time at the same time and then um uh, you can reply to them if you are able to because we've got quite a lot of people with their hands up there's a uh, 140 people have been in the meeting which is a uh, very good but we have to try and keep it <laughs> short hi matthew Nope, oh, you're muted still. Can you try? Yeah, something wrong with your microphone. Still muted. I'm gonna ask um Pamela and maybe see if you can work it out. Oh <clears throat> thank you very much, um Garda. Um very interesting analysis. So my first question is about the role of the Arab states and particularly, I think, the role of Jordan and what happened there, because I'm not very clear about those early days of um, 1948 uh, when I think Jordan was in charge of the um, refugee camps um, after the Nakba. Secondly, 
what happened um, to the idea of Arab socialism? So what what we are seeing now that it was left to South Africa to take Israel to the International Court of Justice and not Saudi Arabia or any of the other Arab states. And in fact, um, it appears that uh, Saudi Arabia is um, actually on the side of, of Israel and not on the side of the Palestinians. And is that... <laughs> I, I mean, I'm assuming that's part of their relationship with the United States, but uh, where they are dependent on the, the sales of their oil, or maybe uh, not so much, because I think US may have independence in terms of oil, but certainly in terms of United States control of the Middle East of the, and the Arab region. Is that why? Or is... Um, is it also to do with the Sunni um, Shia uh, split between um, Saudi Arabia uh, and and Hamas? So that's, that's my first question: is to try and um, understand the role of the Arab states a bit more. And my second question um, is actually to do um, with, with uh, m m what I understand to be Moshe's position, and I don't know if you want to discuss that now or in a couple of weeks. Um, so Moshe says, well, actually, and unless, unless and until there is another Arab socialist revolution, the Palestinians are being completely abandoned, um, you know, by everybody, uh, uh, really. And um, that that is, you know, something we should be uh, talking about and, um, and working on. So that's all for now. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. I mean, that is a crucial question, isn't it? I mean, why would the Israelis give up their privileges, basically, and share with yes. Palestinians? Is I think the the, the question that Moshe Moshe asks. Um, in the chat, uh, there's a question from David. Could you briefly outline um, the differences, if there any, if there were any serious differences between Oslo one, two, and three, and if they matter or not? And another question: Why is why is the U.S. then, uh, or U.S.-led imperialism, as you outlined, Garda, everybody's speaking about the two-state solution. Why are they pushing it if they know very well it's not going to happen? Is it just a sort of delaying tactic? You know, is it just we are doing something, although in reality they are doing nothing? Shall we, shall we leave it at those three questions first? Yeah. And bring sure. some people Thank you. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much for those points. Um, Look, um, the Arab states, <clears throat> 1948, you've got to remember, of course, that the Arab states are not states in the sense that you would understand. Uh, these were uh, very uh, recently um, had uh, had acquired their, um, they'd they'd, at the end of, 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 of colonial rule um, over the them was really very, very short while before Israel was created. So they were not in a position, actually, to um, make any sort of important difference. And that is reflected in the 1948-49 war with the new Israel. Um, these Arab states, which are pushed the whole time by Israel's friends uh, as being uh, ogres and who 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 ganged up on the new Israel, etc. So of course it's rubbish. These were newly independent. They hadn't been able to uh, have enough time to govern themselves properly and to to evolve and to be in a position to fight a war like this against Israel. So really, one has to understand that as the background. Now, in terms of Jordan, Jordan is a very specific example because, of course, part of Jordan uh, had been part of Pal Jordan had been uh, part of Palestine until the the British in 1922, uh, 23, um, it sort of cut it off and made it into into Jordan. So, so Jordan was itself a distillation of. Uh, a colonial order, and um, they were very anxious to be able to carve out territory 
for themselves. So they, uh, it, there was collusion between Jordan and Israel. It's a long story, but it's a horrible story. There was collusion with the Zionists in which, as it were, they dismembered Palestine. So, you know, you, this is Jordan saying to Israel, have this one, and then we're going to have that, which is uh, West Bank, what became known as the West Bank, and uh, Arab East Jerusalem. So, so that's, that, that, that's a big problem with them. And it, of course, is the same, uh, the same situation, even though we're many years further on, um, actually, we, we, we're, we're no, not, not much further forward in terms of how much use this is to helping the Palestinians shake off Zionist colonialism because uh, many of the Arab states, even today, are not what you might think of as um, independent uh, states. They are all reliant on America. And that's crucial. One must understand that. So they don't really do anything which has a potential to upset or offend or uh, otherwise remove American support. So um, really, it's 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 very hard. Now, Saudi Arabia, no, is not on the side of Israel against the Palestinians. No, that, that, that that's not fair. Um, Saudi Arabia, of course, has its own agenda and its own interests. It is interested in closer ties with the Americans. And the, the, everybody knows that the way to get to America's heart is through Israel. Um, you know, years ago, there used to be um, a, a, a woman's magazine which said, a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Well, you know, actually, the way to to the United States, to the U.S., it goes through Israel. That, that's uh, the reality. Uh, Sunni, Shia, no. Hamas is Sunni. They are, they are Sunnis. They're not Shia. So everybody's a Sunni here. Um, in terms of are the Palestinians abandoned? Of course. Absolutely they are abandoned by the Arabs. It's a terrible thing, but they are abandoned by the Arabs, except for Yemen lucky Yemen, where the Houthis have really shown themselves to be more patriotic for the Palestinians, more supportive than any other Arab group. So generally, the Arabs, uh, the, the, the Palestinians are abandoned. Arab socialism, well, Arab socialism was snuffed out very effectively by Israel and the United States. The closest thing we had, which was uh, Nasser, uh, who was starting on a, a road of independence and socialist ideas? Uh, Nasser met us, uh, as you as you know, uh, didn't last long. Uh, Oslo's uh, Oslo one, two, and three, not really. It's no point going into that because it's a continuation of the same. It's what I was trying to do was to outline the fundamentals on which Oslo was built, and so two and three um, were derivatives of that. Um, in terms of the U.S. pushing the two-state solution, yes, because of course, of course, they know that it's not going to happen, and as do, as does Britain, as do the other Europeans. It's it's a really very, um, it's really very reprehensible. This going around pretending that you really want to help the Palestinians through the two-state solution. They know it's not going to happen. They know better than me the kinds of things that I was putting, uh, I, I was putting to you as obstacles to the two-state solution. However, it's a very good panacea uh, because when you produce it, uh, it makes the body that is putting it forward. Uh, uh, it 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 enables them to play the part of um, on the one hand and on the other hand. You know. We support Israel, but we haven't forgotten the Palestinians. That's why we support a state for them, their own state. It's cynical. That's in my opinion. It is cynical. And it has to be called out for what it is. It's a bluff and it's a lie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Matthew, let's try you again. I think your microphone works now. Yeah, is it? All right. So that's, so that's okay. 
Um, right. No, I mean, I think, I think you're right. I mean, the, the, the problem really here is is you is the U.S. I mean, the U.S. has said um, <clears throat> that it's actually passed a law in 2008 saying that Israel must have the the military ability to defeat at least two out of two of the local states, um, and and it will supply you know huge amounts of weaponry. I mean, you know, the, the current uh, assault on Gaza is entirely supplied by Joe Biden, who supplied 10,000 tons within the first few weeks, a couple of months. Um, you know, including most of the ammunition that's been fired in Gaza has been supplied directly from the US. Um, and, and this, of course, is, as you say, also, of course, extends to the um, all the local states. I mean, the, the, the Gulf Kingdoms, I think Qatar and the and UAE were found to be trying to run a road supply network to Israel via Saudi and, and Jordan, which has stopped, you know, obviously was the news to the Jordanian um, masses who tried to get it stopped, obviously, you know. But I mean, these people have no have zero interest in 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 Palestine or Palestinians. Um, and the problem is also, of course, it, 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 the many of the settlements in in the West Bank are actually financed directly uh, from the US and and have even US citizens in, engaged in, in 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 running them. So I mean, it, it, it potentially locks into that, you know, the actual imperialism itself. Um, and so I mean, really, the the the, the solution. If you like, it's not it's not local. The solution actually is in the US, which is why the, the current protest movement is so encouraging that actually Jewish youth, in particular Arab youth and so on in the US, are now protesting a great great volume against this, you know, the fact that the, the, the US is is, is is actually itself running a genocide. Um the other thing, of course, they've done is that there's actually they've moved a, a resolution in Congress. To try and uh, take reprisals against the Saudis for, for for having the temerity to, to raise the question of genocide against uh, uh, in in the ICJ. So because obviously South Africa has a, a free trade arrangement with the US, and they said, well, you know, okay, seeing as you've you've, you've embarrassed us by by this, well, you know, effectively, because obviously the, when they charge Israel, they are charging the US. It's the same, it's virtually the same thing. Um, that, that we will cut off your your trade access. Um, you know, so, so all these things are interconnected. So, yes. Thank you, comrade. Uh, Malcolm, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Oh, yes. Um, I, was, I would just like to ask, I mean, what has always struck me as strange about this whole business is that how... So many people believe black is white about the whole thing. I mean, I think there's very little doubt that what people call Israel is in fact a terrorist state. And the people who are in charge there are by any yardstick criminals, without a doubt. Uh, and so why is it that so many people think the opposite is true? I mean, it goes way back. I mean, the whole Balfour Declaration and the recognition of so-called Israel by the Americans was all based on anti-Semitism, because as far as I know, they thought it was an excellent way of getting rid of or solving their Jewish problem. So why are these sort of quite basic facts are sort of so hidden in everybody's converse, even ordinary conversations with people I have? I mean, I don't even talk to people about Gaza or anything anymore, because people are so badly informed about everything that it's just extraordinary. And, and 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 as for the Arab states, I mean, the huge demonstrations we've seen show that the people in the Arab states certainly don't support the line of their leaders. But another interesting question is why is every, what I suppose you could call an Arab state, actually a sort of dictatorship? I don't think there's a single thing that couldn't be called dictatorship. I mean, it seems to me that the Palestinians are sort of almost irrelevant to this because they were just in the way and just got bulldozed out the way by the Zionists. I mean, that seems to what happened, and nobody seems to have noticed this. And so everybody goes, oh, the bulldozer driver has got all the rights in the world. And, and it seems to me that, that what, where the Palestinians lost out is they weren't any good at propaganda. Where the Zionists were absolutely brilliant at it, and so and they still are brilliant at it, and I can't understand why anybody would ever think a two-state solution makes sense. Because even if you look at the map produced in 1936, I think it was by the Peel Commission. Have I got that right? Am I remembering it right? That didn't make sense. 
and of course it was rejected by the Palestinians at the time and 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 very much supported by the few Zionists that happened to be living in Palestine at the time. I'm sorry that's not really a question, but a range of sort of ranting I suppose. But thanks, Markham. Um, Thank Gada, you. Shall I ask one more person to come in or do you want yeah. to yeah. No, that's all right. Okay, um Sudi, please. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, Gada. Very, very, very interesting uh, meeting. My question is Although I, I believe like you that the uh, two-state solution doesn't work. And I have always been um, a proponent of a one-state solution. But what my question is that it has an uh, Oslo Accord. Why did they ignore the Palestinian in Gaza? Why would they, are they, were, were they thinking, why PLO? didn't do anything about the people in Gaza. Because if you ask about the Palestinians, they would say, okay, two states, three state solution it should be. In which Israel uh, is the local agent for US imperialism. And that's mm -hmm. a well-known um, analysis and description of Israel's, uh, Israel's role. Now, in that sense, you can understand that the United States having maintained the settler colony um, feels uh, it's very important uh, for the U.S. to maintain this state, not as a, as a member of the other states of the region, but one with, quotes, a military edge. So always from the beginning, when Israel was being armed by the West, they armed it with the aim of making it uh, militarily superior to the people around it, which is a very a big giveaway of what Israel was there for. Um, and so that is certainly true. Now, in terms of South Africa, yes, I can see what, which is clear, that South Africa um, exposed this whole rotten setup by going to the International, um, to the International Court of Justice and raking over all the details and making them clear and publicizing them, it's a very, very big uh, embarrassment for the United States and, and the West, because that's what's behind uh, Israel's genocidal um, activities, uh, the support it receives from the West. So South Africa, it's much easier to try and shoot the messenger, as is usual with um, with Israel's friends, you shoot the messenger, and you don't bother about the message. Um, so that that is that is spot on. Now, in terms of <clears throat> um, Israel, uh, a terrorist state, uh, and, and so on, um, why are people fooled? Uh, and the, these uh, Arab um, population. Well, first of all, the Arab populations do not agree with their own rulers. Uh, they have supported the Palestinians all along, and particularly now. So there is a complete disjunction between the Arab populations and the leaderships. Why are they dictators? Because it's very important for the West. Because if you, if you encourage and support and arm um, a dictator, and, and make sure that any re local resistance among the people is suppressed by secret police, etc. you maintain states in a strategic area which are subservient to you. So that's why, you know, so, so many of these Arab states are not what you might think. They really are um, subservient to, to America and are in position and in power because of America and because of American support. Now, in terms of propaganda and, 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 and your question, which was why are people so fooled? Well, you know, we have to actually recognize that the Zionists are very, very successful, very clever and very successful at um, manipulating public opinion. And one really does need to understand that. Uh, they work this day and night. It's not something that even a, 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 a moderately um, better equipped 
um, group than the Palestinians. You can't fight it. They are past masters and they have, I mean, I could do a whole lecture on that because they've set up, first of all, they set up the whole uh, background uh, and the whole context in which you are encouraged to think, which is that uh, from biblical times, etc., that this is their land, etc., and and that unfairly and uh, tragically, um, local people are nasty and, and 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 perform terrorist acts against them, and it's all done uh, very cleverly and consistently, and so you end up with. Uh, either you don't understand anything about it, or you have to take the, the pro-Israel line, because that's the one that's pushed all the time. And actually, the, the questioner, in that sense, put his finger on something really important in this. Even now, look at what the Israelis have done in Gaza. Even now, there are people still prepared to pussyfoot around the issue you, you will notice that when they talk about Israel, they're very careful what language they use, whereas uh, in reality, uh, you know, the, the language should be at least as strong as the one that, um, uh, you know, the media has used for the Hamas actions in on October 7th. Um, as to Gaza and was it ignored? No, it wasn't ignored at all, because I remind you, in 19, um, uh, in sorry, in 2004, uh, uh, in oh, sorry, what am I talking about? In, in 1994, Arafat and the leadership went to Gaza. That's exactly where they set up their headquarters uh, under the Oslo Agreement from the beginning. So far from being ignored, it was actually central to the. Um, Palestinian, what became the Palestinian Authority. It's only because of Israel's actions later that separated uh, effectively Gaza from the West Bank and made that gulf very difficult to cross for the Palestinians. Thank you, Garda. Thank the, you, um, Garda. Yes, thank you. The um, campaign to conflate anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, of course, has been hugely important in trying to shut up anybody who's making any criticism. That's, of course, why why you see people pussyfooting around, people lose their job. Uh, comrades of mine have lost their jobs because they've been accused of being an anti-Semite when nothing is further from the truth. It's an incredibly, incredibly powerful weapon, and they've been very, very successful. And it's, of course, been, as you said, it's been propped up with billions and billions from the US government. And uh, Israel has a whole State Department on, on propaganda around this, this issue, which is terrible, but it works. And, you know, our leaders um, uh, have, uh, have it, it's, of, it's of use to them as well. That's why they support it as well. Um, Jonathan, please, the next one. I am unmuted now. Hi, hi, Lada. We met a long time ago, but you probably don't remember me. The uh, I haven't read your latest book, but I am familiar with some of your arguments. And you seem to have avoided the argument in international law. I, I posted it up in the questions. Let me just repeat it. Why doesn't why don't you? make the argument for one state on the basis of international law. The international community banned genocide on December 11th, 1946, and then made the ban jus cogens. Then the international community, specifically the white states, gave the Zionist colonial settlers a license to commit genocide with impunity. And I consider this argument important because think about um, civil rights movement in the U.S., which argued that the U.S. should live up to its promise in the Constitution, which was actually a lie because the U.S. was segregationist and they pretended that there was a, a promise of equality. But it is actually a, a pro it is actually a genuine promise in international law that genocide will be banned, and the white states are ignoring the ban they created. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Sean, please. Sorry. 
Thank you, uh, Tina, and uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Gada, for a wonderful talk. Uh, just a couple of points I'd like to make, see if you would uh, respond to them at all. Uh, back in 2005, you remember when they um, put a, uh, removed 900, uh, 9,000 uh, Jews from, from Gaza, and the uproar over that. Um, so one can imagine like what the uproar would be like when they try to remove 750,000 settlers from where they're settled now. And these are not very nice people like you. Know, like they're, they're, most of them are Eastern European. So where are we going to put them? In Utah or some such? Uh, that's probably anti-Semitic to say that. Like The other point is that a um, Oslo, like just about every uh, other um, peace negotiation coordinated by the USA, from my understanding of it, the agenda was agreed between the USA and Israel there may have been some sort of an early negotiation, but the final agenda was the uh, between Israel and the USA, and the uh, uh, Palest Palest the Palestinians were uh, sidelined on that. So, hence, whoever sets the agenda effectively effectively wins the game. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Gada, I think maybe you want to reply to those. Yeah, two? sure. Yeah. Sure. Look, the the, all, the 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 point you make about international law is actually very important. Um, but I can point you to something in international law which is even more, uh, should be more effective, uh, if at all possible, than, 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 than genocide um, in terms of Israel. I'm talking about in, in relation to Israel. And that is uh, a little commented on fact, which is that Israel was admitted by the General Assembly to membership in 1949, and it, it did so on the basis of Israel abiding by uh, UN resolutions, which they spelt out, which included Resolution 194, that is the one on the return of refugees, and uh, it included uh, other provisions uh, that, that, that the UN General Assembly um, um, insisted that member, it, in order to become a member of the UN, you had to actually say uh, and, and undertake to support those and comply. Now, it has been very much uh, um, a thought, certainly on my mind uh, and maybe others, uh, that the, that really uh, the Israel has shown itself not to abide by the terms of its membership and therefore should no longer be a member state. And that, you see, is something which um, is not only true, but highly effective. Because if you actually make that argument, then you question the whole legitimacy of Israel claiming that it is a state and that it has rights and and so on and so forth. So um, so I'm I'm agreeing with you, but I'm I'm adding one more dimension to this, which is really quite important. Now, in terms uh, uh, may I make one comment on that? Use uh, uh, gains yeah. is more important. That's a use gains is a non derogatable, peremptory no, uh, international legal norm. When you violate this. A country goes into the same category as a cannibal state, a human trafficking state, or a or a pirate state, and must be abolished. It, there's no choice on this. Yeah. There is you can't trade with it. You can't recognize its citizens. You can't recognize its government. It has to be eradicated. It's more important than a UN Gen, uh, General Assembly resolution. Period. That's the way it works. That's how international law works. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I thank you? That, that was very valuable. Um, that, now, just moving on to the next point, which was the evacuation um, <clears throat> of the settlers from Gaza uh, in 2005. Um, well, the, the thing is, the, the, the whole issue of um, how would you evacuate the settlers from the West Bank 
that is a point that I have made repeatedly to people who push the two-state solution. It's up to them to show to show us how they plan to get rid of, remove the settler, the settlements in the 1967 territories. So it's you're absolutely right. It is something which I think is incumbent on anybody who's pushing the two-state solution. They have to answer that question first. Where do these settlers, how do you remove the settlers and the settlements um, and uh, in such a way that they won't be coming back? So, you know, it's uh, it's another of the nonsenses uh, that's, be, that's o- always talked about these pseudo solutions. It's completely, it has no relationship to the situation on the ground. So I, I completely agree with you. In, in terms of um, what then happened, you know, the Camp David talks, which came after, of course, a few years after um, the Oslo uh, Accord, the Camp David talks, which the US ran, a uh, US totally dishonest broker, should not be in a position to be conducting any kinds of negotiations, uh, acting as Israel's lawyer, really, um, is, is, is the, was the final straw, the humiliation, the denigration of Palestinian rights that happened at, at Camp David. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just a quick follow-up question. I mean, on the international law, uh, that is interesting. The, the case of South Africa is very interesting because it's it's obviously harmed Israel, and you know they've they've had to walk a tight rope there and say you know weasel its way through a bit of criticism. It's been extremely harmful to to Israel. But in general, if we look at United Nations, I mean, the, Israel has been in non-compliance since 1948. Nobody does anything about it. That's the thing, isn't it? International law doesn't exist really unless it's applied, unless it's forced through. And nobody's going to force it through because the US is running it in reality. So, you know, all the states in the world can make broad resolution if America doesn't agree with, nothing happens. So it's a bit of a sham, isn't it, international law? Yes, in so, in so far as, yes, you're absolutely right. Unless you are prepared to implement international law, it remains something that people talk about. And, and of course, we can see it in action with Gaza. It's so very blatant that no kind of law uh, it will be made to apply to Israel, whether international, local, humanitarian law, whatever you want to call it, will not apply to Israel because the United States uh, protects Israel. And so we're back to an earlier question, I think, which was, uh, what? why do we, we need to actually talk a bit more about the United States? Insofar as one way to look at Israel is that it is the creature of the US and other Western states in the service of imperialism, fine. Then in trying to deal with the thing, you if by, de- by demolishing the creature, you still won't get rid of imperialism. I'm putting it very crudely, but that's really uh, something very important that we yeah. should, should uh, constantly think about. Yeah, and that we don't that we don't put too much hope in our leaders because they're not going to do it. We need to put pressure from below. Um, I've got a c- couple of more questions. Firoza, her camera doesn't work, but you are unmuted, so you can ask a question, make a comment. Thank you so much. So. Well, thank you so much for the discussion today. As a South African, I think we understand very, very well that the apartheid system, the Bantustan system that is being put forward by all, almost the entire ruling class globally is not viable, as you have said. However, I think from myself, I would like to know how, as a global uh, solidarity movement, how can we uh, how can we change this narrative almost every media is talking about the two state solution even i think most of the ruling class or states do not understand that the two state solution is not viable they do not understand the current situation they do not understand that what does it mean for the illegal settlers they do not understand there's an apartheid wall it needs to be dismantled or the checkpoints need to be dismantled they do not understand the situation but this narrative of a two state so- solution 
question is becoming louder and louder by the minute. We see it on every media outlet. How So the global solidarity movement needs to start changing this narrative. We need to go, we need to talk uh, to uh, in every corner, every country, start changing our governments, start making them understand why it's not viable and what those uh, one democratic uh, state means and why that is the only possible solution. So my ask very much to the panel here is how does the global solidarity movement come together on this point? Um, and then one uh, one last point, if I may, that the Palestinians have not been abandoned. The Palestinian ha Palestinians have shown us that there's a ruling class and a class of the masses. The class of the masses that are all, we have so much power and there's a clear divide between these two classes. Let's leverage that. So I just want to leave us with this point, but I also would like to have some discussion on how we can change this narrative. Thank you so much. Thank you, Firosa. Um, also without camera is John, please. You can talk now as well. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, thank you, uh, Garda, for such a uh, very interesting um, analysis of the situation. Um, the thing is, is that even now we hear Whilst we're watching Gaza on television being destroyed minute after minute, both the north and the south, we're still hearing that the two-state solution is the only answer. We're even getting the most absurd, because I've heard these, I've, recently I've heard these um, solutions and come out. One is that the United States um, and um, Saudi Arabia, Israel and Palestine, um, they'll leave out Hamas, of course, but so uh, when I say Palestine, the uh, PA, and those that those countries um, will decide, will um, and basically what they're saying is that Saudi Arabia will rebuild Gaza if Saudi, if, if Saudi Arabia give an assurance that they will recognise Israel. And then just the other day, we get something around the lines of that Egypt will re rebuild Gaza. And they're saying this whilst it's been destroyed in front of their very eyes. They put, you know, they've just been pushed into the... In, put, 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 where, where are they going to go? We've had Jordan send tanks, you know, to the border. Um, not to support, you know, the, the Palestinians, but to keep the Palestinians out. Um, we've been in a situation which if it wasn't, you know, if, if it wasn't so serious and uh, horrific, it would make it, you know, it would be a really kind of, you know, good comedy, I suppose. But um, the other thing I wanted to say was, is that this idea of the two-state solution has been going on for so long. I mean, prior to the 7th of October, my understanding is, is that, I mean, when Trump was in power, he 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 decided to say, you know, he he, he pushed this, didn't he? Because he actually um, he was trying to get, um, trying to get um, Saudi Arabia to um, recognise um, Israel. Could uh, you want that now, comrade? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and, and the other, and the other thing is, is that the resources in Gaza, we hear about gas and and so on. Um, and I, I, so, and the other thing is, the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign in this country actually support the two-state solution, but we in Brighton, where I live, we don't support it. And I also wonder how many. Uh, Israeli and Palestinians now support. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to hurry our comrades along, but we want to finish by 8 2025. Gada, do you want to reply briefly? Yeah, to okay. well, all right. Um, <clears throat> look, look, uh, let's just do the two state solution first. Um, it's not very strange that they're all trotting out the two state solution because you know the two state solution from the beginning, um, they were well aware that. It, it it cannot happen on the ground because Israel doesn't want it and it's got all these settlements and so on. They know that perfectly well. However, it's it looks good, it sounds good that what you're really saying is we care about the Palestinians. We're not just pro-Israel. So that's it's it's done for for um propaganda purposes, really. Um the the, the issue with the two state union is that all too far too often. The people to whom this has been told didn't say to the to the to the proposer didn't say show me how tell me how you're going to have a two state solution tell me how you're going to remove the settlements tell me how you're going to remove the settlers show me if you can do that then I'll start thinking about it until then not interested that's really what should happen and of course more voices are being raised now. For very obvious reasons, but the Gaza disaster tragedy is so blatant; it is so appalling uh, that ordinary people, public opinion, is 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 a, a swung against these um, the, the, this sort of propaganda, uh, and so they try ever harder uh, to 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 promote the idea that they actually care about the Palestinians. In reality, of course. Nobody wants to dismantle Israel, which is really what should have been the conclusion from all this. You've got to dismantle Israel. Uh, um, it, it, otherwise, it, it, all this is a waste of time. So that's that. In, 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 in the question of, um, um, you know, PSC, let me just say, quickly just say, PSC's position is that they cannot produce a solution themselves unless the Palestinians say so. So at the moment, the only Palestinian representation we have is the Palestinian Authority. And the Palestinian Authority stands for a two-state. I think that's the explanation they would give. Um, in terms of uh, rebuilding Gaza, uh, of course the Israelis will, will would be, and, and, and their sponsors, would be delighted to get the Arabs to step in um, they're not responsible. They were never responsible for the destruction of Gaza. Only Israel is responsible for that. So, but how wonderful it would be if the Arabs would step in and and uh, foot the bill. Well, I, I can only tell you that it's not going to happen because the Arabs are well aware of all this and they are not interested in 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 uh, in coughing up. So, in terms of now back to. Uh, the comrade uh, from South Africa, I couldn't agree more with you. There has to be a global movement. It is something that this uh, whole uh, Gaza tragedy has shown up. It's that there does exist a global uh, uh, movement of peoples, quite aside from their governments and their representatives, an independent opinion which says, they know what's right from wrong. They can see what's black and what is white. And hence, they really want to uh, uh, make a difference. And this is um, a, an energy, uh, um, a movement which must be mobilized. It it's really must. And it's utterly, but that's where I think the future lies. Now, as to how we do it, how it happens, we have a problem. Because as with all these sorts of um, spontaneous reactions and uh, uh, by, by ordinary people, you need you need a, a leadership. You need a leadership, and you need an idea. Now, I'm very happy to say that the idea has to be one democratic state, uh, which dismantles Zionism and apartheid and 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 so on. That's the idea. Now, how you you have a leadership, you must get a leadership because you yourself know, uh, comrade, don't you, from South Africa, 
you had an African National Congress. The, the anti-apartheid movement didn't just do its own thing, irrespective of nothing. They knew that there was, and they followed a um, a, a a leadership in South Africa. It's 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 a great tragedy that the Palestinians don't have anything comparable at the moment. Well, I mean they're battling for survival as well, so it is it is very hard to fight politically when you don't know, you know, mm-hmm. where you get your food, where where you're gonna survive tomorrow. It's a very horrific situation. We had a question actually in the chat early on. Is there a sort of, you know, apart from for Hamas, maybe, is there a leftist revival of some sort, or is that really impossible at the moment in Palestine, within Palestine, to provide that that kind of leadership? No, it's not It's not happening. It's not possible because um, we are at a slightly earlier stage in this struggle. That's the stage of survival. Literally, people are terrified. They think, uh, they believe that Israel's agenda, uh, and they're quite right to uh, worry about that, is to expel them. That's really what it's about. So their first concern is to stay, to stay uh, on the land. And that's why you see that in amongst the poor people of Gaza who have nothing. And yet, you know that they're all saying, we don't want to leave. They, mm. they don't want to leave. So mm. it's the same fear. Mm-hmm. I mean, for us, of course, here in the West, I mean, the BDS movement has been very successful, which is, of course, part why uh, Israel is being quite so hard, perhaps because, and with the anti-Semitism smear campaign, the, the the success of the BDS movement had something to do with that. So that's something we can support, but it doesn't go that far. We have two more questions. I wonder if you can squeeze them in. Comrades, if you can keep it very short, um, Steve, please. Thank you, Tina. Uh, just hold on a second when I put that. Uh, thank you, Garda. I, I, I read your book and it's very informative and I, I enjoyed reading it. I, I I would like to remember there are many versions of two-state solutions. I mean, we're, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of the Republican Labour Education Forum and we're promoting Republican democratic ideas in the labour movement in England. That's what we were set up for. So we're opposed to ideas like unionism and loyalism and, of course, Zionism because Zionism is an anti-democratic, anti-republican idea. So we, we're, we're opposed to that. And um, we last, uh, we, we, this whole thing about the two-state solution, um, the two-state solution, first of all, it failed, then it died, and it didn't come alive again till, as you say, till October the 7th, when suddenly it sprang into action. And I, If I was going to do a completely barking mad conspiracy theory, I might think that Joe Biden was the one that launched the Hamas attack in order that he could bring his two states policy to into existence. You know what I mean? I don't think that would go down uh, too well. Um, But obviously, two states is basically a Zionist policy. It is about legitimizing partition. Um, It's accepting partition. And that's why even for all the reasons that you gave, and the reasons that it is a continuation of a reactionary policy. Now, on Monday night, and this is a kind of question, we had a an LLA trade union meeting. We passed a resolution against two states. And I would like to speak to Tina after this to send this resolution to you for your comment. But we came to the conclusion that one of the problems we have as you say, two states is such a universal an- um, uh, argument and um, it goes right the way through the Labour Party, the Tory Party, the Liberal Democrats, the Jeremy Corbyn. It goes into all the major trade unions, the TUC, the GMB, the uh, Unite, the RMT. There's not, a, there's not a trade union in this country that doesn't sign up for the two-state solution and that means that we're all bought into this Zionist and imperialist policy without realizing it, by the way, because people, when 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 workers think of this, they think it's like a liberationist thing. It sounds like it will be giving something good to the Palestinians. That, that's what people believe. So it seems like it's progressive, when in fact it's reactionary. It's designed to keep the status quo, as you've explained so well, as it is. Now, of course, if you're going to say, well, 
we've got to fight against the two state solution in the labor movement in the labor party in the trade unions you've obviously got to think well what's the alternative because people will ask you so we come we have an idea which is not quite the same as yours but it's similar i.e of will initial this point two nations one state two nations a federal democratic secular republic of israel and palestine now that's i think in your book that would be binational but i think that ought to be considered it's only a version of binationalism really but i think it's a democratic version of binationalism because i think some of the binational ideas are not very good but one that's based on a democratic secular israel and a democratic secular palestine in one federal republic i think is it to me is the way forward Thank thanks jerry as the last speaker please Sorry, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, I, I'm very encouraged by this this discussion. I I I I I I think it it it, it is very progressive. Uh, um, just just a few points. I do think that the initial um, UN resolution that set up the state of Israel allocated something like fifty seven forty three between. Uh, um, uh, the Jews and the and the uh, and and the Palestinians, although obviously the Palestinians were 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 the vast majority at the time, and I think the eighty the eighty twenty is 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 uh, the sixty seven version of what was left. Uh, what well, the other major point I'd want to make is uh, um, getting rid of the um, of, of of the apartheid state. Uh, is, is really not a solution, and it wasn't a solution in, in South Africa either. Okay, very well, we got rid of the apartheid state in South Africa. South Africa is now the most unequal country in the whole world. The black masses in South Africa are now um, actually worse off than they were under apartheid. But hey, you've got your democratic right to be a billionaire, and you've got one black billionaire there, and that's good enough for us. So um, and the Hamas have some uh, millionaires themselves in in exile. So uh, I, I'm I'm for uh, uh, a, a multi ethnic worker state there, which can only come about uh, through uh, revolutions um, in in the Arab states. They 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 will have to overthrow um, the 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 uh, Israeli working class themselves. Uh, in my view. Uh, are are uh, overcome by chauvinism uh, and and white supremacy, um, although there are principal oppositions within it. But the the, the principal oppositions are, are are quite small uh, and, and marginal. So I I'm for a democratic. Uh, um, I, I I'm for a a, a multi ethnic worker state uh, as part of a socialist revolution there. Uh, I, I I don't think uh, 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 a binational worker state is 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 going to work at all. Um, that 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 was a, a solution that I did once consider myself. Uh, but I, I I think it's it's going to take uh, a, a more internationalist uh, approach to it uh, to, to, to 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 solve those those questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Gada, um, when you're replying now, it'd be great. You could also sum up the discussion, perhaps, if there's anything you'd like to say to, to bring this meeting to a close. That was the last uh, contributions from the floor. So over to you. Right. Um, the the question about Zionism, the first thing was about Zionism. Uh, and, um, you know, it was two states or partition a Zionist idea. Look, very uh, early on, in in um, <clears throat> in the 1930s, the Zionists, which were a they were a minority in the in the country, um, and they were settlers. Uh, they were people who'd come in from outside. Um, were desperate to get some kind of recognition or legitimacy. So partitioning the land in those days was something very positive for the Zionists. However, since that time and since we got a state of Israel, um, Zionism does not actually wish to partition the territory. It should be clear by now 
having looked at what's happened uh, after October 7th, it should be clear. The Zionists want something they've always wanted, which is that the Palestinians disappear and they take the whole of the country for themselves. Um, and as you probably read or heard or people are talking about the fact, this was the opportunity of a lifetime for them. October 7th gave the Zionists the chance to try and put into effect their dream, which they've had from the very beginning, that the whole of the country, the land without the people, that's what they've always wanted. And they haven't changed. So I, I, I would say that that is something that's, that's quite important to, to remember. Now, I think you talked about um, a sort of a two, two nations, two, two communities with, uh, in the same, uh, sharing the territory and in a federal arrangement. Yes, so there are these ideas around. They are, they're, they're around. Uh, but they've not been, uh, they, they've, they've, they, could only be viewed, in my opinion, as a stage. So they're not an end in themselves, because you've got to remember that how the Zionists got there. You've got to remember that Israel is a settler colony. This is the result of settler colonialism. So you don't start to talk about two nations and how can you be federated and so on. Um, that's why I, I, I backed and always back the, the secular democratic state because that's the only fair way for the Palestinians to regain their whole territory. Uh, otherwise, you've given some legitimacy to the invasion of Palestine and the setting up of this settler colony, which is not acceptable. Now, in terms of um, an apartheid state, I think somebody said that's not been helpful. You know, I have to say, the fact that uh, something hasn't, um, there has been a, a lot of difficulties in South Africa um, post-apartheid post, uh, doesn't mean that, that, that apartheid is a good idea. It certainly isn't. You have to remove apartheid, no matter what. The fact that you then have a, a job on your hands to make it a success, that's another issue. But but there can be no, I think, no two opinions about apartheid. Um, in terms of Hamas millionaires, I don't quite know what you mean. I'm not aware of any Hamas millionaires, really not. And I think it's important not to perhaps say that unless you've actually got evidence for it. Uh, in terms of a socialist revolution that uh, that would be wonderful, but it's very idealistic. It's 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 very unlikely to happen in short term, um, in in any kind of term, which would rescue the Palestinians. You know, you've got to remember, uh, Palestinians are fighting for their survival. They really are. So when we talk about uh, what's to be done in, in the future, we always have to remember we don't actually know how this is going to end. And uh, I, I, it, I think it's an extremely uh, frightening, um, very dangerous situation in, in Palestine and in the Middle East. It so, certainly is. So, you, you, and, and, oh, well, finally, okay, so what would I say? Well, apart from saying, please read my book, <laughs> One State, um, you know, but quite apart from that, I, I, I would say that one of the things that I very much hope comes out of the sacrifice of so many thousands of Gazans is that the settler colony becomes dismantled because there needs to be a recognition that Israel is the cause of so much uh, damage in not only for the Palestinians, but the whole region. And it's, it's a threat, really. The Zionist colony is a threat. So it seems to me that um, if there's one, as I say, one outcome from all this which would be truly worthwhile, it's that we would see the end of Israel as 
an apartheid Zionist state. Very good. Thank you very much, Gala. That was a very clear, very, uh, very well structured opening and discussion. Thank you very much, everybody. In the discussion, I think it was really good questions and had a really interesting and, and lively discussion. So thank you all for participating. We've got two more sessions in this series. We're returning to this issue, as I said at the beginning, we're going to have a, a round table with different views on, on this issue with Moshe Mahova there as well. Uh, Tony Greenstyle will be arguing the one state uh, solution or outlook and um, also a, a comrade from Israel who is talking, who believes a two state solution is, is the answer. So we'll be looking forward to that, how he explains that. Um, next week, we're looking at conscription. Uh, there's a lot of talk, not just in Britain, but also in Germany and other countries where they want to bring up back conscription which we believe is uh, is is making the population ready for a really big war, um, which is probably even worse than what's happening in the Middle East at the moment. And we have to also get ready for that and how we oppose that. The drive to World War III is, has become more real now than it has been for many decades. So we want to discuss that um, with Ian Spencer next week. And then we are starting two new series. So thank you very much, Gada, and thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Uh, good night. Bye-bye.